Hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming. It's great to see so many people here. I'm going to keep the introduction business brief um, because you didn't come here to see me. You came here to listen to Dr. Laura Agustin, who is going to be talking to you uh, just after I finish. She will be talking for approximately 30 minutes and um, then we're going to have a Q&A of around 20-25 minutes depending how we go with the time because uh, as usual, we're very uh, tightly in here at the time. Um, again, I remind you there are feedback forms that you should have had on the way in, and uh, if you can fill them out at the end of the thing, that will be grand. Um, and I won't keep you any further. I'm just going to hand over to, uh, to Laura. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not, since it's only 30 minutes, I'm not going to talk about myself first. So if you want to know about me, you just put my name in Google or I'm called the Naked Anthropologist, you can put that in Google and you'll come to my website. And there are lots of things about me, but more importantly about, I blog regularly on the topic and I, um, and I have all my, that I've had academic stuff for a while, I did that for a couple of years, I have all those publications so that you can find everything. There are resources and you can contact me if you want to, but otherwise, since the half hour, I would just like the chance to actually talk about sex work as work without arguing about the meaning of prostitution. Um, the first thing that I usually talk about, it will all be very brief, so these are like thinking points, talking points that later you can ask more about or look up. The first um, problem about talking about sex work is work is the, what you can think of as the problem of sex. That a lot of people think that the topic of sex is, should be sacred or romantic. Um, that it's sex is something that's supposed to happen only with real meaning between people who really care about each other and some people think that they should produce children. Um, and that it should, there should be a certain kind of authentic, authentic emotion involved. And then there are the people, then there's the, others, the other way to look at it, the people that don't necessarily think of it that way. Or sometimes sex is meaningful and romantic and full of authentic feeling, and sometimes it's just fun or uh, something you have to do to use up time or whatever. Um, it's something opportunistic, you didn't plan to do it. Um, you have friends with benefits, so that's what you do with them. Um, it can also, this kind of sex can also be anonymous, public, dogging, and commercial. Now what I usually say to people who are very anxious about which of these is the correct way to feel is that I think of it like a religious question. I think that if you believe that sex should always be sacred and romantic and not wasted in these other kinds of ways, and you find commercial sex horrifying, then you personally should stay very far away from it. But it turns out that many people don't feel that way about it. It's kind of a God question. So that they don't feel that way about it, they feel that they can have different kinds of sex with the person they love and the person that they don't love. Um, so the anthropologically, you can think of this, or like human nature, is that the meaning of the sexual act is not always the same. That seems very obvious. But when you talk about prostitution, it seems to be that we all know what we're talking about, but we don't. The meaning of what the sex means at a different point with a different person is different all the time. Um, sometimes sex feels like labor, even with someone you love. Sometimes you're not really keen on it, and you have sex with the person anyway because they want it, and because, because that's how things work, because that's how the marriage works or the relationship. Um, and sex can be thought of as labor also when you are trying to produce a baby for instance, and you're really working at it, and maybe even you're getting an IDF or something. Um, but so the question is then, what makes something really be work? Why, when people talk about this, why is there so much confusion about it? Um, 
So one way that you know whether something is work is if the government says it is. Some governments keep a list of official occupations that people can have in the country so that when you fill in a form, you tick, I am a train driver, I am a school teacher. Um, so that it seems significant sometimes that there's no way to tick to be a sex worker or a prostitute or escort or lap dancer. That's one way that it can be work. Um, another possibility is if a judge says so. So for instance, in Spain, there have been many cases where for one reason or another, the, the people who worked in a sex club, a brothel kind of club place, uh, ended up in a court where they, were, they had been treated unfairly somehow by the boss and where the judge said, I don't care that these are illegal migrants. I don't care that uh, there's no name for this escort girl in the list, to the registration list. They obviously work for you, so you have to pay social security for them. You have to, you have to do that. So those are cases that happen, and that happens fairly rarely. Um, and then another possibility is when the sex industry, when businesses, sex businesses themselves, are regulated in some way. So, for instance, uh, you, you are supposed to register as an independent escort, or um, in the England and Wales, there's a there's a sexual offences act, and there's a sex businesses act, and it tells you if you have a strip club how the strip club has to be run. You have to have a certain number of security guards. If the dancer comes out into the audience, then a meter has to be kept between the dancer and the customer. There cannot be any touching. There's a list of rules that you can laugh about, but in fact they are typical, ordinary, that kind of rules that any other business has. Um, now, so that's when you think of it as sex entertainment. The ex an example, a well-known example where there's regulation that seems to be working fairly well is New Zealand, which has rules like, okay, we're going to license brothels, but if you are up to four people working together in a flat, you don't have to get a brothel license. So that means that you are legal if you're being a sex worker or an escort in your flat and you're allowed to have people around you. Um, if you are a brothel, then you have to register with the state and comply with all the rules. So when I talk about the sex industry, another reason not to not to get bogged down into the prostitution debate is that the sex industry, commercial sex of all kinds, is really a very wide, it includes dozens of different jobs. Yes, so for instance, uh, I mentioned the independent escort. So now think about such a long list. So then there's the escorts that work with agencies. There are people who take sex phone calls. And that's all they do. They're either in a call center or they're at home, but they're answering the phone so they personally are not having sex, the person on the other end of the line is. Um, there's strippers and lap dancers and other kinds of dancers. The people who dance or show off in peep shows. There still are peep shows in a lot of places. I don't know if you have them here. Um, there are a lot of people working at home now in front of a web camera. So again, there's sex taking place, and maybe both people feel like it's sex, but they're not in the same room together. So you can see why it's problematic to always talk about prostitution. Because what happens is people will say, well, that's not, this one is, but that's not. That one's naughty, but it's not really as bad as this other one. Um, then there's people who sell sex in the street. This is what people ordinarily think of when people talk about prostitution. They think about those girls in short skirts and red stockings in the street. Um, that's a very, very small, diminishing portion of the whole industry now. There's no way to have real, uh, real numbers because this all isn't regulated 
but that's what the TV cameras and the policymakers worry about because those people are so public. So the street workers, the people who work in massage parlors, and I won't go on. The point is that you can't generalize about sex work. Look at that. What are you going to do? Sex work is the following. No. Because which one of those jobs are you talking about? Um, and a lot of those people don't wish to be called a sex worker. Sex worker is a term that's used by activists who prefer the, a lot of them prefer the title of sex worker to prostitute. However, there are sex workers who prefer to call themselves prostitutes because they wish to say that this is an old profession and I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I'm just going to jump over the whole idea about whether people are choosing to do this, whether this is about free will. I consider these jobs to be like all other jobs according to the opportunities you have at the moment and the luck you have in the job market and the people that you know who help you get in contact with people. You may find out about a webcam job or find out about a peep show job and so you're not choosing, you're not sitting and saying which of all these things. You're trying to get something arranged for now. Um, and a lot of it is occasional, so you need a little extra money, so you, it's the end of the month, and so you know you can go do phone sex for a week and be able to pay the rent or something like that. So these are not, a lot of people are not having that strong professional sense. In the sex worker rights movement, you do meet people who have strong professional feelings about what they're doing. Um, that's, they're an important group, and I support them. But my work was about migrants originally, and it certainly wasn't about people planning their lives. A lot of it is opportunistic. Um, so then the idea of problems related to work. So the kinds of problems that I know about, because I've been in the sex industry world for 20 years and listening to people's stories and going to their events and um, the problems don't have anything, they're not about clients. So this whole story that you told about, it's all about the exchange between the, the, the escort or the street worker and the client and whether this person is violent or not. No, this is not what people talk about. Most people are not violent. Most people anywhere are not violent. Um, so examples of the kinds of real problems that people have. For instance, in New York, trans, um, trans street workers are picked up by the police. If they have too many, what's considered too many condoms with them, they can be arrested for prostitution. So that's considered a big work problem that if you, you want, you need to have the, you need to have the condoms to do the work, but you can't be caught with them by the police, therefore you're endangering your health. That's a work-related problem because you can count on the police to take advantage of you. Um, in Mexico, for instance, uh, a lot of bar girls, so that means you go into a bar and you hang out and you pick up people. You have to drink a lot. So a lot of people complain that this work environment forces them to drink too much alcohol. In some places, the clubs, people have the client has to buy a bottle of champagne and expects you to uh, share it. This is a hostess job all over the world and people have too much to drink. That's a work-related problem. Um, in London, which has uh, many thousands of escorts and people who work in flats. The problem is that the law does not allow you to work with someone. So this means that you are very exposed. This is a counterintuitive idea. You would be safer if you could have another escort there with you or the classic maid in the, in the walk-up in Soho. But those people are being accused of trafficking or being a pimp or exploiting so that the work-related problem is I'm forced to live alone and also that's very antisocial. People, all people do not wish to work alone. Um, in
in the in the Thai in, in Thailand, uh, sex workers are very organized in a lot of places, and they've now said that they've uh, they've solved all of their problems, all the problems that they used to have. They've worked it all out with the police and with the clubs and all of that. But the problem now is that everyone wants to come and rescue them. So this is what my work has been about. But now they have to deal with all these people coming in and saying, you don't really want to do this, we have to take you out of here. That's what they've identified in their annual report as their biggest work related problem. And in terms of strippers and dancers, I suppose there must be some in this room, um, the biggest problem is that you have to pay now to work. You actually have to pay a stage fee in most places now, most countries, to be allowed to get up on the stage and pole dance or lap dance in corners or whatever in order to make money. Now that's very unusual. How many, how many jobs are there where you have to pay the boss in order to be allowed? Those are the problems, plus police harassment. Not about the individual moment between the client and the sex worker. It's about the, the social context for all this unregulated stuff. Um, so that's why what I wish that we would do is talk about this as a labor sector. What would happen if we talked about sex work and the sex industry as a sector of labor in the economy? You can think of it as a service sector, like being an air hostess or a therapist or a call center person. In this case, you can think of it as emotional labor, uh, where you follow a script and you try to please the customer, and there's a kind of um, traditional back and forth about it. And another alternative for a lot of the jobs is to call them entertainment. A lot of people feel that that's what they're doing. And in the entertainment paradigm, then it's a performance. Just like me here, it's a performance in which you are trying to reach certain people with a certain kind of message. You may wear a uniform to do it. You are probably pretending to like or be interested in people that aren't really interesting, but that that's part of the job. And as you all know, that's part of a lot of jobs. This isn't unusual. Um, so sometimes this gets called the sex sector, which was also the name of a book. Um, it's a structural approach to looking at sex workers' work, um, how governments see businesses. So the way governments do their accounting, governments have something called accounting, where they decide which businesses, which professions are going to be recognized as belonging to the formal economy. And those will be registered with the state and those workplaces will be regulated in some way so that you, they pay a fee to get the license, they have to get the liquor license, they have to get the sex license, they have to um, provide toilets for the workers, they have, the workers have the right to object to things, um, there are inspections by people from the state, this is normalization of um, the workplace. That's what the formal sector is, and that's where you find workers' rights, because it means that if you go to the boss and say, I I don't want that schedule you're fining me for coming late. It's not fair. You have some kind of redress. There are some kind of rules. There is someone to talk to. Um, and the opposite, the other side of this, is the informal economy, which is everything else. Everything else, um, and everything else is more or less disqualified from being counted. However, in some countries, like India, the informal sector is far bigger than the formal sector. In Brazil, the informal sector is amazing, it's huge. So everything you do in, as a favor for someone, all of the drug dealing, all of the pickpockets, all of the sex work, all of the businesses, the DIY, the 
paying to barter with your neighbor in order to get the, some work done in your house. All of those things that you ordinarily in your life do informally without it being registered with the state are called the informal sector. And in the informal sector, all bets are off. Workers have no rights. So everything depends on your relationship with your boss whether you can manipulate or make nice with your boss so that you can make things work out for you. So this is where exploitation takes place. And this is where, if you see my book, Sex at the Margins, which was about migrants who are smuggled into countries and then sell sex, most of the time nothing bad happens. But the situation is all both the travel and the work are completely unregulated. And therefore, of course, you have opportunities for bad things to happen. It doesn't usually happen, but that's where the opportunities are. And as long as this is all considered informal, then workers can't do anything except try to leave a job that they find unbearable and go try another one. Um, in 1998, the International Labor Organization published a research report based on years of very good, real, grounded research, quantitative research in four Asian countries on the sex sector. That's the name of the book, The Sex Sector. And they found these are all four countries where a lot of sex businesses are regulated so that they could see what, how many people were doing what and what problems there had been and what kind of yeah, uh, suits had been filed and who was uh, doing what. And they also were able to compare with some, some things that they knew about what was happening in the informal sector. And they, first they found, and so this is also, there's no emphasis here on the personal relationship between the prostitute and the client. This is, this will go nowhere. This is about the businesses in general. Um, so what they found was that, first of all, in some of these countries, huge, huge pieces of the economy go into sex businesses. And there are interesting reasons for that that have to do with war and exploitation, but that have resulted in places like Thailand having an enormous sex industry where many, many people work. And what they found was that fully one-third of all the people uh, working were not selling sex. So that means that all of the, the waiters and barmen and people doing laundry and people selling clothes and security guards and drivers, all of those people made up fully one-third of all the employees with all their families all of their dependents and families depending on that as well. But these are businesses that are integrated into the economy. And the ILO concluded that the only way to make things safer and more just for people selling sex and all the other people working in unregulated businesses was to regulate all of the businesses, was to make everything, put everything into government accounting, make it part of the formal sector so that there could eventually, over time, be control for what's going on and businesses wouldn't be in limbo and taxes would be paid and workers would have agency to object to things that are wrong. Now, people usually want to know uh, but what about trade union and what about organizing? Well, I have to say that the most successful of the, of the organizations that exist are not technically trade unions. Um, the DMSC has 60,000 members in India, 60,000 prostitute sex workers of all castes, but many of them are the considered to be the lowest tax. So that they actually, they negotiate with the government and they try to control the red light districts and they, and they have had 
quite a bit of success. 60,000, of course, India is huge. So, but that seems enormous to a place like Europe, where everything is very small. Um, there is also, there are examples like Ahmad in Argentina, where the, technically the group belongs to a union. So there's a national union that has allowed them to be inside but actually doesn't do much about it. So the, the women are on their own trying to still fight about stigma and uh, the usual problems, what the law is going to say, how the police act, violence from police, etc. So it's not that it doesn't work at all, but the um, examples in Europe, for instance, are, um, they are failures. They are failures. They have tried in Germany, um, in fact, in Germany, Holland, uh, England and Wales, and somewhere else, and Spain a couple of times. So what, what it means, it's not like the union has decided. There's been someone, some management level union officer who has said, pardon, who has said, we'll let you have a, a branch here, and then nothing much happens, is what it is. Unions don't know how to do this organizing, but the real question is if these businesses are not regulated, how? How can you negotiate for better conditions? It's almost impossible. Um, a lot of workers themselves see no, they're not activists, they see no benefit in coming out and being public. The stigma about being a sex worker is not much better than the stigma of being a prostitute. People don't understand. They become disqualified from the conversation. So most people just want to get on with doing their work and avoid problems. Um, people who have uh, jobs may not want to register because they like the aspect of the informal economy in which when you don't like it anymore, you can just slip away. You don't even have to give notice. You can just slip away and go do something else or go for a holiday. Um, now, in Europe also, half of the people who do this work, at least half of the people are migrants. They're undocumented. Enormous numbers of them are undocumented. So that means you have no right to work at anything. You have no work permit to do anything, much less work in <laughs> an unregulated sector. So that also makes things incredibly difficult in this Europe of tightening borders and miserable Frontex and all of that stuff. Um, the other kinds of organizing that happen have been much more kind of successful. It has to do with movement building amongst uh, people who sell sex. So there's a network of, uh, an international network of sex work projects. They negotiate with UNA. Getting in by the health uh, door is, has been obviously the way for a lot of people to be able to be listened to somewhat. So in Australia, the Scarlet Alliance is a member <coughs> of the Prevention of AIDS organization in the, in the country. Um, Right now, I'll end with a, kind of a negative thing, but it's interesting. There's a, something called the Sex Worker Open University, which has only been around for a couple of years, which does sort of organizes a week of events in which some academics come, but it's largely people giving workshops on different things. They had everything set up in Glasgow this year. The Scottish TUC had agreed to let them have one of the um, events in their hall, and they pulled out at the last minute. After the, all the brochures had been sent out, all of the stuff had gone out, they pulled out. They said, you can't have it anymore. Now, why is that? That's because some, some feminist idea inside the women's sector of the Scottish TUC got really angry. And this is also what has stopped a lot of the stuff that's happened in other countries. So they managed, they, they managed to get press releases out and to find another place to do it, but this is the kind of reason why I said originally that I wanted to be able to have the half hour of talking about this without bogging down inside the old 
very old repetitive prostitution debate. Thank you.
by the end of the 90s, I had concluded the feminist debate is going nowhere. It's boring. It reproduces itself. As long as we decide to argue with that so-called radical feminist position, we're allowing them to frame things. I refuse. That's why I'm doing this. I refuse. <laughs> I think there's a... Okay, I'm an unusual person, and I understand that it's not so easy for everyone to do this. But simply reframing what you want to talk about, having a meeting in which you don't think you have to have balanced people talking about the meaning of sex and whether real feminism, this is a dead end. So I've been listening to this, I have a blog. There are now 80 on one random, one random piece that I actually published some time ago. There are now 80 comments. So there's a radical feminist in London who's confronting at least 10 brilliant arguers on the blog. I could almost publish, you could publish that comment stream. All the arguments are made. They just, and they, so they call each other names. That's part of the game. They're very insulting toward each other. But also, they're all good writers, and they all make all, and they all, no one convinces anyone else, and they're not going to convince each other. That's what I decided. That's why I said it was like a religious question. So personally, I think that if you have any kind of meetings or talks or anything, choose other, choose other topics to talk about and do not be allowed. Now, I know you think that it has to be, but I decided it doesn't have to be. We don't have to make feminism different kinds of feminism. And believe me, I've been a feminist since the 60s. I was a second wave, I was a third wave, I'm now a fourth wave, and I'm sure I'll go on because I adapt to what people tell me. I don't keep to what I found out in 1953. That's ridiculous. But that's what's going on. You're not going to change that. There's a sense of incredible crusade on the part of the radical feminists to maintain a fundamentalism about the meaning of prostitution. So I really don't have I just exhort you. On your topic, I don't accept anthropologically and as a researcher and as a pragmatic person that the commodification of sex is a bad thing. Everything in life has been commodified now. If you want to talk about utopias, I'm not the best person to talk about. Obviously, I'm interested in pragmatic solutions. That's why the feminism thing, I'm not interested in a utopia in which there wouldn't be any. No, that's not my job. So it might be your job, and it might be other people's, but not mine. I want the conversation to be about what could we do in this union, or to give a space, or to have a class where some something else can be talked about, and who, who could we talk to in government about regulating businesses? And maybe some of the Irish MP would be interested in thinking about ha regulation of lap dancing clubs or whatever, to have those kinds of conversations and not focus on a utopia <coughs> in which the thing that I said at the beginning, some people think that sex should never have any money in it. I personally don't understand that. Many people think marriage and is about sex and money. Many people think that. Not only rich families who are arranging, but other kinds of people understand, and usually someone stands up and says that. So I don't, I'm not working toward that world, personally. What more? Questions? Yeah.
is, is in the light of the oppression of women that kills women every single day for violence, for example, and promotes an ideology that continues. Do you have a question for me? Well, well like, I have a different viewpoint. I put it forward. You can, like, disagree. Well, but this is about questions, so... Well, I don't know. Maybe you can let me make it. Okay, well, I think that's, that's actually poor, like, because it's much better to have a debate. Well, yeah, okay. Do you, do you, do you recognise that the sex industry, as it is constituted, can play a negative role that actually... Uh, promotes an ideology that leads to violence against women, for example, even I even left the question. I, I really do. In, uh, in, in Britain, like universities have, have uh, shown that where okay, that we're time, a little so time women now. We're a little time. Time. for time here. I think we've got your question. Um, I'm going to move on to the woman here. Thank you. Hello. I noticed when you were speaking, you were speaking within the framework of assuming the state as a given. And I understand now from what you said, you're pragmatic. My question is, is there a way in which we can both serve an anarchist vision and improve the condition of sex workers, like uh, forming some kind of collectives or, or something like that, or, or some sort of syndicalism, so that we can do both. Use it as a tool to be able to create more on anarchy rather than playing according to the rules of the state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the third question. Um, yeah, so Canadian health is sort of the best example for a lot of sex mm -hmm. workers in the, um, uh, the law there is decriminalization. Um, and I read that there's certain critiques about uh, New Zealand, especially for migrants, mm -hmm. and how it's not necessarily <coughs> The next law, and I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should say that when I have more time to talk and talk about my entire trajectory of research, I make it very clear that I don't think that this is an easy question. I think that the world is completely fucked up. I agree that we live in a patriarchy. I think that many of the things I've described are clearly sexist. They're sexist ideas, and the men have more money, and they're the ones that can do this, etc., etc. That all, for me, is a given. It's a given. Um, do I recognize that the sex industry, or some kind of great general thing, is some kind of agent of patriarchy? No, because what I have done is resisted using broad general terms that don't describe all of the different jobs, all of the hundreds and thousands of different people in different countries. My work is international, so in a country like India, no one is going to say the sex industry is patriarchal. Even if it is, they're dealing with trying to get rights and agency for individuals to be left alone. Um, so I should also say that I do not consider this only a woman's issue at all at all. If you work in the sex industry or you work in the activism and in the collectives that exist, half the workers are men and trans people. This is not about women selling and men buying. Now someone's going to say, oh, but the vast majority. In fact, there are no real statistics. So obviously the people who hate prostitution are focused on women who sell to men and not much worried about men who sell to men or men who sell to women. They're, that's We understand what that's about. But this is not, to me, a woman's question. I don't consider that anymore. Um, as for whether, whether I accept the state, well, I accept all the different states. So I personally don't like any of them. And I've lived in probably 50 different countries. I don't. <coughs> That it's not that I personally, I do my best to avoid everything. I hang out with people who have collectives of things, who do other stuff. And as I mentioned, there are many collective endeavors that are sex workers themselves or sex workers and allies or small feminist groups like them fight back in, in London. Um, the people that are running the sex worker open university, these are things that come up together. And as I said, in, in uh, Australia, for instance, in a lot of the states of Australia, the laws are pretty good. 
those sex workers have an alliance that's national that gets some things done. So there are many different ways to get things done um, without asking the state for things. But if you're concerned about the structural situation of the labor, then you're not going anywhere unless the labor sector is recognized, unless it's in the, in the, in the, in the formal economy. Um, New Zealand has gone the farthest. The activists and people who study law like the New Zealand law the best because it seems to be the most respectful toward individuals so that you can three or four people who want to work together do not have to register with the state. But lots of people, guess what, like to go to a workplace every day and clock in and then have some rights when they're there so that the brothels are regulated and fair and bad things don't happen there. In order to get that law passed 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago, they had to agree to have an anti-trafficking clause and so they said that no migrants, no foreign students can come. Even though we've accepted that this is a normalized labor sector, no one can come from outside and work in it. So there are people who work in it as students or migrants, but they're doing something illegal. So from my point of view, that's a huge <coughs> negative thing about it. But certainly as a model, that and New South Wales in Australia, they work pretty well. They work pretty well. That's all you, that's all you can say. Um, when people try to talk about prostitution law, though, as though it's an abstract and you could just take the New Zealand model and bring it to the UK or Ireland, you know, New Zealand is a tiny country with a small homogeneous population. Uh, Sweden is tiny population, pretty homogeneous. It has the opposite kind of law idea. These are not things that are easy to export into places that are highly multicultural, where there's a much larger sex industry, where there are many more businesses and many more migrants. So they're interesting, but you, they all would have to be adapted for the particular place. Thank you. We've got about five minutes left, so any quick questions I go on there. And one more there. And I'm going to leave it at that, then I'm going to leave the microphone for Laura. So. You can come and talk to me afterwards as well. Uh, I like the fact of uh, you talk about uh, sex work beyond uh, the crease of uh, prostitution on the street, actually, indeed, the vast majority of the sex work is out there. And the other comment of yours, the late one, about sex work not being, let's say, about uh, women, but covers all the spectrum of human beings. Mm. Uh, my question is that I, had, I read that recently that in Ireland and in Scotland, the government considered legislation that would be brought forward there. The, criminalization of purchase of sex. Mm -hmm. And um, I want your take on that. Plus, but I want to ask that if it was to go down that road with exceptions of people that they might have some special needs and they need to cover sexual needs, what do you see mm -hmm. that as yep. a solution or problematic goal mm -hmm. after that? Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a um, if you think there's a case to be made for greater e education about sex work uh, for young people, I was thinking specifically about uh, cases of endocrine or uh, complicated dating in Japan um, among teenage girls and young women. Mm -hmm. just the case where, um, as with any job, um, when you're kind of teaching the youth about labor, for them to know what to expect and know what's within their rights, a lot of these cases, then despite having um, a fairly normalized um, sex industry in Japan, mm -hmm. Very, very. To a great deal. The fact that these are young people um, working alone and individually take, taking that step kind of, uh, without any, any background or without any education or anything. Just, um, I suppose towards furthering the sort of normalization and acceptance of sex work, mm -hmm. um, do you feel that that's something you're advocating? Mm -hmm. Is there a third one? Is there a third? 
No, there wasn't. Okay. Um, again, so a few years ago, I moved to Sweden. It's a migration story. So that's where I am. And this uh, leg legislative model that the man in the back referred to is usually called the Swedish or the Nordic law or the Swedish model. And the idea, it's an idea about gender equality, w was that you would allow sex workers to sell sex, but you would penalize the client. And this, um, which is impossible to prove either way. I, I was part of the people that analyzed the government evaluation. They didn't know how to evaluate the law after 10 years. They admitted it themselves. There really is no way to know what the true effects of all the effects on numbers, how many people, because most of the, most sex work that takes place now is on the internet, and no one knows how to do that research and really be sure who's doing what and how many people have separate profiles and stuff. Um, but as a marker of gender equality, that law has been exported, been picked up on, by governments all over the world, and right now it's being talked about in Scotland and uh, Ireland. It, the people in favor of it take the radical feminist position about the meaning of prostitution always being the same and always being violent, uh, violence against women, <coughs> and that, the, that there's an idea that there's a marketplace if you end all the demand for commercial sex then the supply would go away. This is the single most important error. This is not how. That's a very kind of Walt Disney idea about how markets work. Markets move and adapt all the time. It is not at all true <laughs> that if you had no demand at all, you would have no supply for anything. But much more important that's left out of this is the incredible cruelty toward all the people who are making their livelihood selling sex, for whom no, no alternate employment is, is really offered. So obviously, if you're only focused on the 15 people on whatever street it is around here, you say, well, we'll have exit strategies for them. Well, we're talking about thousands and thousands. In the world, we're talking about millions and millions of people, and most of the people say, I don't want you to stop my possibility for raising my family doing this or for the migrants. So that's the first problem. It obviously, there are men who consider that against their rights as individuals. I can tell you from living in Sweden and belonging to the sex worker rights organization in Sweden that there's a single effect that we've seen from this law in 10 years which has nothing to do with stopping trafficking or making the sex industry shrink. It's got to do with increased stigma for the women who sell sex. It's worse because it's considered such a terrible thing to do that you get social workers who decide that you're a bad mother and try to take your children away from you and all of the classic kinds of things that you wouldn't think would happen in a rational kind of socially engineered but that is the research that we're doing now and uh, finding out. Um, as far as disabled clients, that, of course, is a group that a lot of people are agitating about, that this is the only way a lot of people can have sex. And so why are you trying to take it away from people who are willing to pay uh, people who are willing to do this? There are people, that's a theme that is talked about quite often. But of course, when people have these uh, debates about the law, they're talking in a very abstract, large way in which individual problems are not considered. Um, in my experience of Japan and young people who sell sex, they inform each other pretty well. And in Japan, it really, in Japan, compensated dating is called. It, it would be pretty hard to find a young person who didn't have lots of information from the internet and her friends and her mobile phone about what to do. I think that Japan is one of the more rational, sensible places for their people that will never accept this because these are 
teenagers. They're considered children by the UN Convention on Rights of the Child. But there's very little, uh, very, very little sexually transmitted disease in Japan. There's very little violence toward anyone who sells sex, including teenagers. So I, I, my vision is pretty positive about people not needing help so much from the outside, but being allowed to have space to figure out what they want and ask questions. And so in the normalization model, that would be more possible for people to do, to ask each other, what, what's going on? What should I do? Thank you.